Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Um, today I'm making a new mead and this is for a competition. Uh, there is a wonderful group called the Mead House who hosts a competition called the Iron Bee. And the Iron Bee is a limited entry um, competition that is special in that they send you a, if you, when you sign up for it, um, you get sent a secret ingredient. And so what I'm doing with this, because of course I could release this now, uh, which is in February, early February, and kind of give away the secret ingredient. I don't want to do that for, for them or those people. So you'll see um, pretty much this mead from beginning up until I send it off. Um, but they, I've entered into this contest and hopefully we'll do well, we'll see. And the, the secret ingredient that they have sent that I had to really think about what to do is, or are I should say, fenugreek seeds. Now I had never heard of these things before but they are a seed um, <clears throat> that I, I, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with these. And so I, I started looking up some, some ideas and I think I've come to the conclusion that I want to make a tea um, out of them and as the base for the tea, the fenugreek tea, seed tea. Um, and I did that, I did a little test. I put some, about a tablespoon, into some water boiling, water boiled, it made some tea. And what's interesting about these are they have a very earthy, uh, um, taste to it. It's a very earthy tea, um, no, no citrus, very warm and kind of mellow. And I was like, how can I pair that with something that will be interesting? So what I've decided to do is pair it with my, um, with some fruit. And another thing too, what I'm going to be making is a, a basically a pear tea um, with the fenugreek seed as the tea and then put some pears in it. And then I also want, I think that it'd be interesting to try and put some cilantro in there as well. Now that's totally off the wall. I have no idea how it's gonna taste. I've never put cilantro into a um, mead before. And <clears throat> I know I like it, but I don't know how it's going to turn out. So um, with that in mind, of course, I'll go ahead and list all my ingredients that I'm going to use. But I really wanna try this and see how it, how it turns out. I have just enough fenugreek seeds um, to do basically about a gallon and a half of uh, tea. So I'm gonna do that. I've got my water here um, and I'm gonna boil that and then we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I will put the pears into the secondary and I'm gonna put a bunch in. Uh, for a gallon and a half, I figure I wanna put probably six to eight pounds of pears because I really want that flavor to impart super well. So I won't put them in now because I just start, I will just started it, I wait till the um, secondary. And then finally I'll finish it off with that cilantro at the very end. I don't wanna add that too early either and have it ferment on it. I want it to be kind of like an after flavor. Um, but I have no idea how this is gonna turn out. It might not be very good frankly, um, but it's worth a test. And for the Iron Bee, I figure why not try something new, try something different, and um, maybe it turns out to be pretty good, okay? <clears throat> that means that the, our first step is to make our tea, and it won't take very long. I'm gonna go ahead and pour my water into uh, this container so I can start heating it up to boil. I'll pour all of my fenugreek seeds in. Um, this is about four ounces of fenugreek seed, and I've used just a little bit for that tea I tried. Um, so I'll pour all of this in there, let it set for probably five to um, six minutes, and then uh, I'll pull it off and then let that sit for a few minutes, strain it. But we'll go through that process right now. Here is um, boiling some water to get ready for our tea. All right, I forgot to turn on my microphone for that, but what I've done is the water was boiling and then I poured the fenugreek seeds in, let it boil for about a minute and a half or two, and then I pulled it off and now it's gonna sit for about five to seven minutes, just like this, and kind of stewing and letting the, the um, tea really kind of impart its own flavor. All right, our tea has been, um, has been going for about five, or excuse me, six minutes, and um, <clears throat> I would like to go ahead and take the, try to get the seeds all out of it. I believe it's, it's strong enough. Um, 
I don't want to, of course, let it sit for too long. So what I'm gonna do is um, actually put it into my bucket that we'll be fermenting in. But one thing I've done with that bucket <coughs> already is measured out at eight pounds of honey. So in here right now are eight pounds of honey. And we're just gonna basically pour this right on, uh, on top of the honey, mix it all in together. <coughs> and then we can talk about our yeast. All right, so one thing I've also done is I have basically, this was an old lid for a honey uh, container, and it obviously, uh, it didn't really fit the other things, so I'm kind of using it as a mixer. I just drilled a hole, I'm able to stick my, um, this is my wine degasser, um, through it, and now I want to go ahead and uh, stir this way, but now I can stir without a lot of risk of getting everywhere. I can even double, make sure I don't get stuff everywhere by putting a towel or something around here. So, now I'm going to stir this up quite a bit. Alright, I've pretty well stirred up um, the, the must right now. This is obviously very hot because it was boiling water, boiling tea. And um, what I want to go ahead and do is I'm going to let it set. It's not great to take a gravity reading right now because it might be kind of inaccurate. Um, we're going to actually start looking at our yeast. So the yeast we're using are, uh, I'm using a liquid yeast for the first time, not a dry yeast. This is the uh, White, uh, White Labs WLP090. It's kind of like a beer-ish yeast, but um, it will get us to about maybe 12%, 12, 13% ABV. My goal with this one is to try and, um, and, and keep it sweet without having to back sweeten. That's why I did four pounds of honey for the two gallons as opposed to just, um, excuse me, eight pounds of honey for the two gallons as opposed to just doing three. Uh, this needs to be, uh, it's cooled down now, but, or heated up I should say, because it was in the fridge. Um, this is going to be put into a yeast starter. So what I'm going to do is actually uh, separate out a little bit of the must right now. And then we're going to take that and we're going to put it into this wine bottle. And then from there, um, we're going to let it sit for a little bit until the yeast water kind of calms down. Then we'll, excuse me, the must calms down. Then we'll pitch our yeast. So I'm going to go ahead and do that um, and put some into this wine bottle. All right, so our wine bottle or yeast starter will sit for a little while. This is still very hot, like I said. This is very hot. The next step we can uh, do before we go ahead and end up having to um, uh, to wait a while is get our nutrient and yeast energizer ready. We are going to need, um, based on what our yeast energizer and our uh, yeast nutrients say in our staggered nutrient schedule, which means that we're going to put in uh, we're going to put the entire dose into uh, of each one of these into this, and then over the course of um, four days, different days, we're going to put a quarter in. So I will put a quarter of it in today, and then this is a day zero, day two, day four, day six. Um, because we have two gallons, we need about two teaspoons of yeast nutrient, and we need about a, a teaspoon of um, yeast energizer. So. We're going to go ahead and um, put that straight into here. Here are the two teaspoons of yeast nutrient. And then we want our one teaspoon of yeast energizer. Now these things will help the yeast to thrive and develop and ultimately um, just ferment the best. They won't have to, to try and find uh, <coughs> other food or, or metabolize anything else other than these nutrients which helps the progress of fermentation going along. Um, then I can go ahead and shake it up and um, we're going to have to wait. Now I'm going to go ahead and close the top of my other lid and then I'm also going to uh, basically just have to wait until everything cools down because right now that is way too hot. 
All right, so what I've done is poured some of the must into here and then I've pitched my White Labs yeast um, <clears throat> straight into it. Basically, now I'm just gonna stir um, and then I will ultimately uh, go ahead and add it straight back into here so our yeast starter can get going. The colony of yeast can, um, can you know, start building up. So whenever we put this into here, uh, it is all, all going to ferment quickly and not have to take some time, take a lot of time to start fermenting. All right, we're stirred and ready to go ahead and just put it right back into what we're gonna use for our starter. All right. That is going to sit for as long as it takes for the yeast to start to get going. So um, I guess we'll find out pretty quick. Uh, the next thing, I have actually bought all my pears already. Um, I'm gonna let them ripen a little bit before I cut them up and then freeze them. Um, but I wanna go ahead and let that wait. We're gonna see how long it takes for the fermentation to start here. And then this is still hot. Um, then it'll take its time to cool as well. So uh, we play a little bit of a waiting game. I'll be back very soon. All right, so I've had a little issue with this yeast starter. Um, it like, didn't start for whatever reason. So I'm gonna switch from the Y uh, White Labs to, uh, I've gone ahead and rehydrated with my normal process, a Lalvin D47 packet, you see here. And um, so water, 105 degrees. I put my uh, gopher and protect in there and it's been sitting for about 30 minutes. So now the next step is using a new yeast starter we're going to go ahead and um, basically just pour this into, pour the new yeast starter into, or the new yeast, excuse me, into this right here. And then that will be our yeast starter for now. So now we have our second yeast starter. We're just going to put our cork and everything on it, our seal, and then let this go ahead and get going and see if it starts fermenting. All right, so we just added our yeast starter into the must, to the must that was left over. Um, and it's okay for some oxygen to get in because we need the oxygen and the rest of the uh, mead to mix together. The next step is really simple. Um, we're just gonna let it set and the yeast, because they've colonized in here pretty well, should start to really start moving with the rest of the mead. So. Uh, I'm going to close the lid, of course, and we're going to store it and make sure that it stays within our temperature range, which is relative to about, um, D, the D47 is like about 59 to 70-ish, so luckily my house sits at about 68 most of the time, but I'll put it in my temperature cooled fermenter um, for a while, so we're going to store it now. Okay, this is day four of the fenugreek mead. Um, and it's it's fermentation so uh, the the new yeast the yeast that I pitched is now been in here the d47's been going for four days so this is also a day that I'll go ahead and um, use a quarter of my stagger nutrient and I'll have one more after that I want to take a gra gravity reading gravity reading is saying that we are at 10.06 which is great the fermentation is moving along um, and uh, I I'm excited to see how long this takes. The D47 normally moves pretty fast. So um, my last thing I wanna do is get my quartered portion of my, uh, of my staggered nutrient schedule. And what I'm gonna do is actually pour it into this container and then uh, let it kind of foam up and go crazy. And then I will go ahead and put it into the rest of it. So here is my last quarter. I'm trying to use my hydrometer. And it will start filming up a little bit. This is also a decent way, it's not the best for, you don't use this as the primary reason to way to degas, de but ultimately um, you can do a little degassing with this. So now I'm going to introduce it in slowly and we get a little action, just a little bit of action from there. Alright, 
And now um, we're going to take and stir this. Again, hydrometer is not the best tool for this, but I'm going to stir just a little. Still degassing. Yep, this needed a lot of degassing. And then I'll put my lid on once this calms down and let it sit for a little bit longer. All right, so the peaches, or pears I should say, have been sitting for, um, have been freezing rather, for about uh, five days and we'll break them apart. So, leaving it just like that, we'll see how uh, this helps it clear in 12 hours because uh, I haven't given an update, but my the primary fermentation of the fenugreek mead is actually done, leveled out. It's been sitting. Um, and so 12 hours from now or close, we will go ahead and add uh, this into um, the fruit or into the, the mead. All right, so here's um, kind of why I'm doing the pectic enzyme thing. This is one of my pear meads that I have before and it is not clear. Has no real chance of clearing up, frankly. Um, well, it does, but I'll have to use some, a bunch of other things to do it. So I want to try to avoid this and see if I can get it to be clear in the first place. Okay, it has been 12 hours, uh, and the pears have been sitting in the, t the pectic enzyme uh, to hopefully help them clear up pretty easily. And what we need to do is we need to do, we need to take this and put it into a new bucket. I'm using a bigger fermenter. This is like a, a six gallon fermenter because my pears will take up some space. I'm afraid that there's not enough space in a three and a half gallon. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start racking this over. But while this is getting racked over, I want to take a quick gravity reading. So what I'm going to do, um, of course, I've sanitized everything with star sand. We're going to go ahead and start racking it over. And of course, going from a higher surface to a lower surface. Okay, so we have our test tube uh, that it is now has our fenugreek tea mead in it with the honey and all that stuff. Let's see where it has landed ultimately. It is at, and I know you're at different angles right now, so you can't really see exactly, but it is setting at 1.00. So yeah, it is setting, it's actually setting, it's really close, but it's setting at about 1.0, like 2.5. Sorry, 1.0025. So really, barely, barely, barely any sort of sweet, um, which is totally okay with me. Uh, I think that a semi-dry will be good, especially because the pears I'm about to add in are going to uh, ultimately have some sugar to add to the to the meat as well. So uh, I'm not too worried about sweetness because I think it will it will come. We're going to go ahead and finish off moving it over, and then we'll get our pears all mixed in, and we'll uh, deal with those. All right, here's what I have left. This is the <clears throat> lots of dead yeast at the bottom from the primary fermentation, and a little bit of the mead, or must, whatever, mead, excuse me. Uh, but obviously we kind of have to lose some. I will pour all, all of this in in a moment, but I want to get a little bit for a taste test. We have our gallon and about a half-ish uh, in here, and we're now going to take and put in the pears. Alright, the way I'm going to deal with these pears, because it has the, um, the pectic enzyme water, water on it, I'm just going to kind of turn this over lightly and let the water drain out. Um, and then what we'll do, once this is fully drained, is uh, we'll take and put it, them all into a bag. Okay, so that's not working. So what I'm going to do instead, plan two, my muslin bag. Uh, I'm just going to put it straight over it, kind of hold it a little bit tight, make sure I have some space. Alright, so we have all of our pears here, they're clearly draining any uh, extra pectic enzyme water off of it, which is great. I'm hoping that pectic enzyme will actually help um, the the clarity of it in the end and keep the pectic in the pears like those in apples and all that stuff from taking over too crazy. So now I'm going to tie this so it can't drain or so nothing can get out I should say. And our next step is going to be to put it into the mead. So let's go ahead and do that. All right so we're going to go ahead and put it in and uh, I, I will say that this these will sit for about two weeks and then I will go ahead and um, 
end up moving it over. Well, we'll see, two weeks, I don't know. It really depends on how much flavor and parts. I'll do some taste testing along the way. So, I'm gonna throw it in. And because the bag's all closed, um, I should be able to pull them out super easy in the end, but they should impart their flavor. We'll see how much uh, they mess with the clarity of the mead. Um, I'll give some updates now about how it's going. Um, with the pears involved, we'll see if there's any further fermentation. I don't think so, um, but let's get a quick taste test um, to also see what it's like before the pears. All right, so before the pears, here's a little taste test. This is the tea and the um, honey mixed together, basically are traditional. It's really, it's still got a little sweetness to it, which is great. I think that's where that like point zero zero two five came in. Um, the earthiness of the seeds that I was talking about before is really apparent. It's really a nice warm taste. Um, It's really interesting. It's, uh, man, how do I, hmm. Fenugreek seeds are something I've never messed with before, so I'm still trying to figure out, like, flavor profiles of them and, and figure out what, what they are. But really, like I said, uh, I think it's like an earthy slash, not dirty, um, I don't have a great description for it. I wish I had a better one, but I do feel like the the sweetness of the pears, the character of the pears is gonna round out that flavor and then the cilantro on top to really kind of put a little extra zing on it. So I'll be interested to see what that's like. But this, as it is right now, without anything else, is pretty good. Um, so we'll see how the fermentation goes or how the secondary fermentation will be with the pears involved. All right, so our next step, <clears throat> it has been a couple days since I stabilized it, <clears throat> took care of it. I am going to take this cilantro and we are going to, uh, I haven't necessarily put in, like on exactly how much I want. I don't know how much to put in. I know cilantro is strong. So really, um, I would say this is maybe like an ounce. I have no idea exactly how much of, of cilantro, which is bad on the scientific side, but this is also a giant experiment because I don't know how cilantro and the mead will mix. But we're gonna put it straight in, kind of like dry hopping. Um, and I was thinking about putting it in a bag, but then I was like, well, for maximum like coverage to get into the mead and everything, and I'll rack it off anyways and make sure to get anything else out, it's not gonna matter. So I'm gonna put it right on top. So this is now our cilantro that we've added in, the fenugreek, peach, oh my gosh, fenugreek, pear, and cilantro. Uh, mead and I will uh, actually stir this in just a little bit okay I'm gonna stir this in just a little bit nothing too crazy just to get them kind of wet um, and the good thing is I've I star sanded them before I would put them in the cilantro in but then um, there's also the fact that we have some alcohol content that will help the them from growing anything we're gonna let this set like this for, I don't have a definite amount of time because I wanna see if the cilantro imparts its flavor really well. If it is quick and in three days, it taste has that cilantro um, kind of uh, taste with it, then I'm probably gonna move it out. But if it takes two weeks, who knows? I will update you though in just a few days with the current-ness of the cilantro mead. All right, so here's what we have. Um, I overestimated how much I, this bucket could hold. This is two gallons for a bucket, and I'd originally moved it into that, but then I was at the brim, as you saw, so I just moved it into another three and a half. Um, now, we're going to take, and we're gonna back sweeten, and let me tell you about my back sweetening process. Because this has been stabilized, we're gonna be able to back sweeten um, with honey, sugar, whatever. We're gonna do honey this time. And this is my avocado blossom honey. It's not the same honey I'd used originally to start this mead. However, uh, I think it'll work. The way I want to um, to back sweeten is by pounds, by weight. So my little honey container here, um, this, this right here has exactly, this right here is 3.15 pounds. I think I'm gonna add at least a pound in. And the way I want to do it, I don't want to um, stir super heavily because that will oxidize the um, mead. So our plan is going to be to take 
our stirring, big old plastic stirring rod here. And uh, I have a bottle of star sand solution. This bottle of star sand solution in this. And I will just spray this to make sure it is, of course, clean and sanitized. Now, we're going to take and add a pound of honey in. And the hope is, um, I'm hoping that that'll be enough to back sweeten as much as we want. We'll see. So really I'm just gonna pour some and then measure it. This will also mess up the clarity a little bit of the mead itself. And I pulled some out before. Um, so before you're like, oh my gosh, this is the mead itself before I am back sweetening. So uh, we are at 0.9 pounds, almost a full pound. Okay, let's stop right there. That should be a whole pound of honey. That is a entire pound of honey. And I'm trying to make sure this honey doesn't go everywhere. Now we're going to take and stir, like I said a moment ago. And I'm not going to stir like crazy. I really just want to try to um, try to get it integrated fairly well. And uh, one reason I don't stir super crazy is because I don't want to oxidize it at all. It has been stabilized, and um, we don't really need any oxygen in there because that's where you can start to get some bad flavors from oxidizing, oxidization, however you say it. Um, of an alcohol. That's why wine goes bad um, if you don't drink it fast enough and you just leave it. Um, if you open it and then you leave it out for a while, the oxygen gets to it and then that's when it starts to go bad. Same thing for mead. Uh, does not happen as much with spirits because um, they are such a high alcohol content that they, um, they kind of support it well. All right, so before I, uh, I'm gonna let this sit for a second. And uh, let me get a little taste test of our current before the sweetened. Okay, so before the sweetening of it with our honey, this is what it tastes like. A smell of cilantro is already there just on the, um, on the nose. So that's pretty nice. Uh, I think that it, it's not too powerful, but it's definitely like prevalent. Definitely a clear, hey, this, is, this has some extra flavors to it. Whoa, that's really interesting. The cilantro is not heavy. It's kind of like on that back end of the, of the taste. It's definitely dry, which is good for sweetening. I think that'll help. I'm gonna save a little bit so I can compare it to the non-sweetened here, but it's got a very, um, not juicy, which is, it's definitely not juicy. It's a, uh, the fenugreek, tea that I made has that earthy flavor and I was really wanting to round it out also with the pears. So those pears, you get the, the punctuation out of the, um, the sweetness, sweetness of it is there. And so you get, um, it's not too heavy. I wish it was a little bit stronger for that pear side. And I don't know, I've had a little problem with pears in the past on how to get them, the, the flavor of a pear to really impart into a mead. But I think this is a fair amount. And then that cilantro just kind of soars over top. I'm wondering how the sweetness of the honey might um, might affect it. That's really, actually pretty good, even as it is right now. I do think the sweetness is necessary though. Wow. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna finish stirring this and then uh, I'm gonna get a little taste of the sweetened version. All right, so I have both of them here. This is the sweetened version. Um, Color-wise, I don't have enough for a great color show, but the one, the avocado blossom honey is definitely darker, so that added to some darkness to it. It's gonna be a little less clear as well because honey <laughs> kind of takes away some clarity and it will, um, it might work its way out for clarity wise. It might be that this mead's not very clear in the end. I don't know. I'm a little scared to start using clearing agents because I don't want the flavors to be stripped. Um, smelling them, this is definitely, uh, clearly not the sweet one. This one, you can smell the sweetness, especially the freshness of the honey being in there. That character is, is there. Let's get a taste. Whoa. Yeah, that's really interesting. Huh. So that, um, 
the honey, it's like a good amount of sweetness. It's not, not too crazy sweet. I think it'll, I think it's like a, um, a very drinkable mead. The way that the honey and the fenugreek tea, that warmth, that earthy tone, and the, um, the, pear, the pears are like, it's all combining super well. It's really interesting. I think that, uh, I do wish now the cilantro flavor is a little bit hotter, but I do also worry about the cilantro flavor being too much and it being like kind of scary. I want it to just be like a topper, kind of like a little bit of icing on top of the cake just to get to taste, but not anything crazy. This is still really good though. Yeah, that is, that's a good, that's a good mead. I'll be really curious to see how this ages in, um, based on where I'm at in the timeline of the competition, I can only really age it for about a month ish and then I'll have to send it off. So, um, the next step for, for what's going to happen and, and we'll get to there is I'm going to let this sit, uh, in the, in this bucket for a little while and I'm, it's not preferred to age like this, but it's not going to, uh, ultimately I'm not going to age it in the bucket. Like I'll, I'll send off my bottles, but I won't um, bottle it all. I'll only bottle a little bit of it to let the rest of it age kind of thing. Um, but I'll have to send some off anyways. I'm excited for this. This is two, these are two very different because of the honey, very different flavors, but I, I think that it's going to be a, hopefully a successful mead and we'll find out, but I'm excited to uh, see what this is like. So uh, the next step you'll see, well, after some aging is going to be a bottling and hopefully sending off the um, rest of this. And I, I can also, uh, I forgot to mention, I can take a gravity reading too for where it will be at. I'll take that in a couple days when all the honey is for sure dissolved and then I'll take a new gravity reading to see where it landed um, with that. So I'll be back actually in a couple days with a new gravity reading. All right, so here's what we have. Um, I overestimated how much I, this bucket could hold. This is two gallons for a bucket and I'd originally moved it into that, but then I was at the brim as you saw, so I just moved it into another three and a half. Um, now, we're going to take and we're going to back sweeten. And let me tell you about my back sweetening process. Because this has been stabilized, we're going to be able to back sweeten um, with honey, sugar, whatever. We're going to do honey this time. And this is my avocado blossom honey. It's not the same honey I'd used originally to start this mead. However, uh, I think it'll work. The way I want to, um, to back sweeten is by pounds, by weight. So my little honey container here, um, this, this right here has exactly, make sure it's all right. This right here is 3.15 pounds. I think I'm gonna add at least a pound in. And the way I wanna do it, I don't want to um, stir super heavily cause that will oxidize the um, mead. So our plan is going to be to take our stirring, big old plastic stirring rod here. And uh, I have a bottle of star sand solution. This bottle of star sand solution in this. And I will just spray this to make sure it is, of course, clean and sanitized. Now, we're going to take and add a pound of honey in. And the hope is, um, I'm hoping that that'll be enough to back sweeten as much as we want. We'll see. So really just gonna pour some and then measure it. This will also mess up the clarity a little bit of the mead itself. And I pulled some out before. Um, so before you're like, oh my gosh, this is the mead itself before I am back sweetening. So, uh, we are at 0.9 pounds, almost a full pound. Okay, let's stop right there. That should be a whole pound of honey. That is a entire pound of honey. And I'm trying to make sure this honey doesn't go everywhere. Now we're going to take and stir, like I said a moment ago, and I'm not going to stir like crazy. I really just want to try to, um, try to get it integrated fairly well. And uh, one reason I don't stir 
super crazy is because I don't want to oxidize it at all. It has been stabilized and um, we don't really need any oxygen in there because that's where you can start to get some bad flavors from oxidizing, oxidization, however you say it, um, of an alcohol. That's why wine goes bad um, if you don't drink it fast enough and you just leave it, um, if you open it and then you leave it out for a while, the oxygen gets to it and then that's when it starts to go bad. Same thing for mead. Uh, does not happen as much with spirits because um, they are such a high alcohol content that they um, they kind of support it well. All right, so before I, uh, I'm gonna let this sit for a second and uh, let me get a little taste test of our current before the sweetened. Okay, so before the sweetening of it with our honey, this is what it tastes like. A smell of cilantro is already there just on the um, on the nose. So that's pretty nice. Uh, I think that it, it's not too powerful, but it's definitely like prevalent. Definitely a clear, hey, this is this has some extra flavors to it. Whoa, that's really interesting. The cilantro is not heavy. It's kind of like on that back end of the of the taste. It's definitely dry, which is good for sweetening. I think that'll help. I'm gonna save a little bit so I can compare it to the non-sweetened here, but it's got a very, um, not juicy, which is, it's definitely not juicy. It's, a uh, the fenugreek tea that I made has that earthy flavor and I was really wanting to round it out also with the pears. So those pears, you get the, the punctuation out of the, um, the sweetness, sweetness of it is there. And so you get, um, it's not too heavy. I wish it was a little bit stronger for that pear side. And I don't know, I've had a little problem with pears in the past on how to get them. The, the flavor of a pear to really impart into a mead, but I think this is a fair amount. And then that cilantro just kind of soars over top. I'm wondering how the sweetness of the honey might, um, might affect it. That's really, actually pretty good, even as is right now. I do think the sweetness is necessary though. Wow. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna finish stirring this and then uh, I'm gonna get a little taste of the sweetened version. All right, so I have both of them here. This is the sweetened version. Um, color wise, I don't have enough for a great color show, but the one, the avocado blossom honey is definitely darker. So that added to some darkness to it. It's gonna be a little less clear as well because honey <laughs> kind of takes away some clarity and it will, um, it might work its way out for clarity wise. It might be that this mead's not very clear in the end. I don't know. I'm a little scared to start using clearing agents because I don't want the flavors to be stripped. Um, smelling them, this is definitely, uh, clearly not the sweet one. This one, you can smell the sweetness, especially the freshness of the honey being in there. That character is, is there. Let's get a taste. Whoa. Yeah, that's really interesting. Huh. So that um, the honey, it's like a good amount of sweetness. It's not, not too crazy sweet. I think it'll, I think it's like a, um, a very drinkable mead. The way that the honey and the fenugreek tea, that warmth, that earthy tone and the, um, the, pear, the pears are like, it's all combining super well. It's really interesting. I think that, uh, I do wish now the cilantro flavor is a little bit hotter, but I do also worry about the cilantro flavor being too much and it being like kind of scary. I want it to just be like a topper, kind of like a little bit of icing on top of the cake just to get the taste, but not anything crazy. This is still really good though. Yeah, that is, that's a good, that's a good mead. I'll be really curious to see how this ages in, um, Based on where I'm at in the timeline of the competition, I can only really age it for about a month ish and then I'll have to send it off. So um, the next step for, for what's going to happen and, and we'll get to there is I'm going to let this sit uh, in the in this bucket for a little while and I'm, it's not preferred to age like this, but it's not going to uh, ultimately I'm not going to age it in the bucket. Like I'll, I'll send off my bottles, but I won't um, bottle it all. I'll only bottle a little bit of it to let the rest of it age kind of thing. Um, but I'll have to send some off anyways. I'm excited for this. This is two, these are two very different 
because of the honey, very different flavors, but I, I think that it's gonna be hopefully a successful mead and we'll find out. But I'm excited to uh, see what this is like. So uh, the next step you'll see, well, after some aging is going to be a bottling and hopefully sending off the um, rest of this. And I, I can also, uh, I forgot to mention, I can take a gravity reading too for where it will be at. I'll take that in a couple days when all the honey is for sure dissolved and then I'll take a new gravity reading to see where it landed um, with that. So I'll be back actually in a couple days with a new gravity reading. All right, it has been a couple weeks and um, we're actually ready to go ahead and ship this bottle it and ship off the two bottles that um, I'm gonna be competing with for the Iron Bee. So what I'm gonna do is use this auto siphon with tubing and then at the very end is a bottling wand. This bottling wand is just gonna go in the bottle and uh, my plan is to go ahead and bottle all of this one gallon because I have another entire gallon that I'll let age for a while in, in bulk. But I don't wanna bottle just two bottles of this and then have a bunch of air space on top um, to mess with the mead. So we're gonna go ahead and bottle as many as we can. I have down here, I don't know if you can really see it right now. Um, I have a bunch of bottles that are uh, low to the ground so that I can hopefully get have gravity help me as I move the mead into them. Um, and I have already uh, sanitized everything with my star sand and water mixture that I put in this bottle. So, uh, process super simple. Stick this, stick your auto siphon in. The hardest part is getting started because it's really a multi-handed process. But once it gets going like that, um, we're ready to go. So I will go ahead and uh, bottle as many as I can with this and hopefully keep out anything that's at the very bottom of them. I will also mention that <clears throat> I uh, rinsed out these bottles before putting anything in them so that, of course, if, there's, if there was any uh, um, dust or any bad things in there I don't want, um, they were able to come out. I'll be back in just a moment with all of these bottles hopefully filled and we will go from there. Okay, so I have finished um, putting them into the bottles. I have came out with about exactly, actually, uh, 11 bottles in total, which is pretty good. That's about average for getting, um, for a gallon of mead, a gallon of liquid, you'll get about 11 to uh, 10 to 11 beer bottles worth. So uh, the next step is going to be to cap them. Now I have a capper, I'll show you here in a moment, and then we will talk about the whole shipping process and what I'm supposed to do with that. All right, so the capping process is easy. You take your beer bottle. This is my capper that's attached to a piece of wood so it doesn't move. We're gonna stick a cap underneath here and you press down. And that's it. So now we do this with the rest of them, the other 11. And while I'm doing this, I'll go ahead and kind of explain to you the process for what they want at the Iron Bee. The competition itself, of course, is a very well organized event. So they, uh, I'm shipping off two of these in a moment. And when I ship them off, um, of course, they need to be uh, capped and sealed well so that if there's any spills, obviously it doesn't go everywhere. Um, I'm going to use a mixture of bubble wrap and um, a, a gallon plastic baggie just to secure it super well. And then uh, we will ship it off. I'm shipping off two bottles and there is, uh, there's not gonna be any labels added to them like of my own. They don't want us to um, to send anything that's got like my, like my normal man-made me logo stuff um, is not, not allowed, which is fine. They want just the specific label, not affixed, just rubber banded around. So it's just got information about, um, about me and what I'm sending. So I uh, will be doing that here in a moment. I've just got two left. These are a little bit coated with some mead because I uh, got some on the sides, so I'll need to rinse them off. Eventually, I will do my own um, labels for this specific mead because I still do have one gallon of it and I'm only sending off two bottles. And if I were sending off you know, all of them, then I wouldn't do it, but I want to have my um, 
cool label stuff that I've done before available. So I have some ideas for that. And uh, I'm a little bit stuck currently at what to call this because calling it the fenugreek uh, tea and pear and cilantro mead is a lot. So I need to think of a clever name for it without, that will take up less space on a label. Um, but I'm, I have not gotten there quite yet. So I'm just uh, drying these off, get the mead off of them. Shipping meads and beers and wines is um, very, uh, it can be kind of difficult. You have to be really careful about packaging it because if you package it wrong and you don't give them the protection, the bottles could break or just a million things. So I'll show you in a moment what I'd like to do with mine as I send mine off. And then um, after that, when I send it off, it's a waiting game to see kind of what they say about the mead. So let's go ahead and talk about packaging, what I'm going to do to package them. All right, so here's how I'm gonna package these. I only really have to send two, but I'm gonna go ahead and send a third one, like they say on, on the uh, website for the Iron Bee. You can send a third as a, just in case one breaks in shipping, and I figure I have enough mead to be able to do that. So I'm cutting a piece of bubble wrap that I will first cover the bottle with like this, and then put a piece of tape around it. This just, number one, ensures that uh, when I put these into my gallon bag here, that if they don't clank against each other. So I'm gonna do this, one, and I'll do this number two, and number three. This might be um, a little overkill for packaging, but I would rather be safe than sorry, like I said earlier. Come on, there we go. Two. And I'm keeping them in the, the ga uh, gallon bag here because this is kind of like a just in case the one of the breaks, obviously I don't want it spilling out of the box that I'm gonna be shipping in. So, here's number three. And I've, I've bought, I mean, this supply stuff I bought was off of Amazon. Because Amazon's great and they have a lot of good things. Okay, so I have all three of these here. Gonna Close that bag, close it up, and then we'll get the box we're gonna ship in. So we're gonna ship in this box right here, and this will fit just like that, perfect. But before I do that, I'm gonna give it another protective layer. And actually bubble wrap just around this whole thing. Okay. Now, I really don't think that's gonna have any problems. I mean, I could wrap this side too as well, but I don't think I need to. We're gonna put this in this box. And then, my last little secret, um, the way I have tried to keep air out, or excuse me, um, keep space from messing up, <laughs> or excuse me, to take up more space in the box, uh, recently is I have been taking gallon uh, baggies like this and then filling them with air. This is kind of the cheap way of buying the air savers. And then, so I have this, and then I just take a piece of tape and ensure that the air can't escape from there. Put it in like that. So now, there's no way that this thing is gonna go anywhere. It is going to uh, be just like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and uh, basically just put my tape across here, and this is ready to go ahead and be shipped. There's nothing else I can do, because we're done.
I'm at the Iron Bee here in Minneapolis. Really excited to share this with you guys. I want to show you kind of what it's like, kind of what's happening in this other room where everything's happened. The, the um, competition's already occurred, so they've already uh, ranked everything and given, of course, their opinions on it. And so we're excited to hear about what mine ended up as. But here's kind of what the room looks like. I have the results of how my mead turned out. And uh, I will go ahead and flash a picture on screen of this score sheet I am looking at so you can follow along and, and um, give me your opinion. But here's what the judges said about my mead and uh, I found it really interesting. So uh, they rank various things like, of course, your carbonation, at least if you're looking, if you're looking at my sheet, and I'll probably try and post it on here as well. There's a carbonation, so still, petalent and sparkling. Petalent is your carbonation level, kind of medium ground, at how carbonated it is. And uh, mine, of course, was not carbonated, so it's still. Sparkling is very carbonated. Uh, sweetness, medium sweet, so uh, it's obviously not a sack me, not super sweet, which is true. Strength, it was a standard. Around, you know, 14%, nothing crazy, 10 to, 10 to 14. Um, and then you get to other portions, including things like bo uh, bouquet and aroma. So just your smell, when you're smelling your mead. They said, um, I've got two sheets here, by the way. Sheet number one, um, sheet number one, I'll go through both of them at the same time, basically. Uh, said sweet floral, it's a low, I'm not sure what they mean by that, medium minus honey, so they didn't get a lot of honey flavor out of that, so that's out of your the honey category, kind of on the lower end of aroma. Alcohol, they said not a lot of uh, alcohol smell, which is interesting as well. Clean and smooth on this other one. Um, fermentation, clean. So uh, flocculation is what the term for that is, meaning uh, if there's stuff still floating around, you can kind of get leftover things, cloudiness. Um, and so they got clean on both sides, which is good. It's a good thing to have. Complexity, sweet, spice, herb. And then uh, the other person said moderate. So, um, which is interesting because I didn't really get a very spicy flavor from my own mead. I got more of a... Um, earthy, Her, uh, I guess herby is the other one, herby. And then other one, other is what it says, spice dominates with fresh herbal character, uh, which I would agree with. And then spice main player is what this other person said. So uh, overall my category of bouquet and aroma turned out to be about a six out of 10, and that was from both of the judges. So. Not bad, not great, but it's okay. Appearance is the next part. We've got gold on both sides. Uh, legs, one person said none. The other person said thin to medium, kind of in between that range. Clarity, uh, close to brilliant on both sides, which is great because uh, clarity, stupidly enough, makes a big difference in how your mead, um, you know, judges. Carbonation, low, whatever. Uh, slight haze written on for appearance. Four out of six. Again, decent score, not great. Flavor, this is where we get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, honey, there is a low to medium, subtle background of honey flavor. Presence, medium, but other flavors more forced, which is interesting because I back sweetened with honey. So I don't really know how the honey character didn't propel itself as much forward. It's okay though. Uh, sweetness, low, which is good. And then the other person said sweetness, medi like close to medium. Mm, it's interesting. Uh, acidity, close to medium. <laughs> the other person said acidity, low to none. Just enough to balance what they said. Uh, tannin, which is like another character flavor that when you're making a wine or mead, you kind of get that um, that taste in your mouth that, uh, what's the best way to explain it? Kind of 
kind of leaves you sounds stupid smacking your mouth a little bit doing that thing that's like your tannic flavors uh one person said the low to medium kind of in between the other person said low to medium some on the finish alcohol moderate and clean and smooth carbonation none none great body medium and then the other person said closer to full which is interesting too uh aftertaste not I'm trying to read their handwriting because it's a little crazy not as something something pleasant pleasant some i don't know what the other words are aftertaste they said close about the same though almost in between quick and lasting and then balance some hibiscus from spices some bit hibiscus some bitterness from spices um, spice and herbal with mm, hints of veg vegetable and some slight not spice horseradish interesting that's odd get the cilantro slight pear is this other part they gave one of them gave a 13 out of 24 pretty medium ground the other person put a 17 out of 24 which is interesting so my overall score for this mead uh, which is of course what all of these numbers play into the role uh, i think you can get a max of 50 points and so uh, here is the overall. They put classic example. They didn't even, one person didn't even, just went down the middle with it. Five, five, basically. Feedback. Here's where I'm interested. A complex mead. The spice, vegetable, herb, characteristic, dominate the honey a bit. Overall, clean and enjoyable. Boost honey impression to bring out balance. So I wonder if uh, making this mead, if I would need to... Um, add more honey in the beginning to try and balance out that honey flavor. I don't really know. Uh, the other person said, I like the something up front, front flavors and the end flavors. There is a most harsh bitter just before the swallow and some vegetable in the lingering that are not pleasant. It's like drinking a salad. Wow. I interesting. It's like drinking a salad. Huh. So I mean that that's the the consensus of this. My first mead competition I've ever entered and I don't necessarily have a placing. Um I I don't know where I placed in it ultimately maybe there will be some information that pops out about it we'll see i don't really know but i'm very interested to see if if that comes out but also how i can improve on this so the mead house competition this iron bee was a fantastic event for myself and i've walked away with um just a great experience but also good information about my mead making and then i could show you guys so many things that just coming to the the event that I walked away with like physically. I walked away with, and I'll grab them real fast. So from this competition, I walked away with a bottle of mead, which I mean, being in Minneapolis, I was trying to find mead as it is. And I got a bottle of mead from them, but I also got some other things. I got a ton of Amoretti things, which I love Amoretti now that I've started using them. This is basically peanut um, syrup. I got to figure out a way to use peanut yeah. syrup. There's also a bunch of other Amoretti things. Um, this is cinnamon bun, like natural flavoring. Don't know how to use it yet. Perfect for my watermelon mead. My watermelon, this is watermelon extract. I actually have three of these and I had to, I was gonna have to go buy some more of them, but I got three of them. Again, saving money, super nice. Um, I have another Amoretti thing. This is cookies and cream, natural flavoring. I gotta figure out a meat or something for that. Um, pineapple habanero jam. So, again, probably a good mead option. And then finally, one of the coolest things I'm most excited for is this book, which is the art of mead tasting and food pairing. And this book is fantastic for trying to learn more and more about how to um, not only make mead but how to pair it with your other flavors. So. 
I'll be excited to go through and read it and get some more information. So the event itself was amazing because you get to be around people who make mead and who enjoy making it. But also, I learned a lot. I got stuff out of it. And frankly, I just, I mean, I had fun. If you like making mead, go compete with it. And if you want to do something big, do the Iron Bee. Iron Bee was a fantastic event. And I could not recommend it more. So that just might be the end of this video. I'm gonna wait one second before I end it off, just in case there are some placement things where I find out where I ended up. All right, we have reached the end of this entire whole video of my Iron Bee entry. So this was a, a fantastic event for me to go to as I just talked about a moment ago. Um, and I, I came out with a pretty successful mead. I found my, out my placements. It wasn't an official placement thing, like there's no uh, record of it down, but I talked to the people who ran the Iron Bee and uh, found out I placed amongst 33 total um, entries about 17th. So right in the middle. I'm very content with that, frankly, because I, I tried some of the other people's meads who had competed and they were, they blew me away. Like, especially the, the top three, I was able to try a couple of them and it's just fantastic. There's, there's no reason for me to have gone up any further because they, they were way better than mine. And I have a lot to learn, which I'm totally okay with that. I think 17th is pretty good. Um, I, I'm just very content with that and I hope to compete in more things in the future and get even more feedback. So this is my, my final bottle. This is what I've ended up with. It's my original label that I like to use. And I've called this mead Mellow Mood. And um, of course you don't really get to try it because we, this is video, um, but it is, I call it Mellow Mood or Mellow Mood Mead because um, man-made mead, I like all the M's, all those things. But also it is very earthy, um, maple-y. It's, it's a very just relaxed mead. And so um, I kind of like keeping that as the uh, name, so. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, I am excited to compete more, like I said, and continue to put out videos. This is a big, long video to watch, but uh, it was a lot of fun to do. It took, I mean, this video has been running now, going along for, uh, oh gosh, since February. So, and it is now May. So we're looking at a four month video compiled all together. But if you have made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for your, um, commitment and uh, watching. So check out the links uh, that I have down below. I have a Facebook page where we get to talk about mead making. It's a lot of fun. There's a Patreon where you can help support me and you can help me uh, continue to not only grow as a mead maker, but you get access to early uh, content. All my YouTube videos early. You get to um, you get to be part of our live streams that are for patrons only. And there's uh, a bunch of other stuff on there that's really fun and it directly supports me, which is great. There's also a, a merchandise store, there is a P.O. box, and uh, a website, manmademead.com, where you can find um, like, kind of like a little blog, but also Amazon links, and those Am Amazon links, affiliate links help me out as well. Um, so all those things support me. Um, it was a lot of fun to make this video, even though it took a long time, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. So, see you guys next time, and I'll be back with more. Cheers.